Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. Who are some of the other acts that were part of the, the bill, you know, besides that David Bowie show that's pretty wild? Um, but uh, who else do you remember? A handful of people you could share with us. Uh, I remember at one point we were opening up for for a Mars Day. Uh, Paula Abdul. I think it was on an MTV tour. It was. Forgive me if I got this stuff wrong, but I know these were the artists that we we actually toured with from time to time. It was Paula Abdul. There was one where it was Tone Loke. Uh, Millie Vanilli, um, sometimes uh, Run DMC, you know, uh, we've even, we did a show one time with uh, Naughty by Nature, and uh, we were the, the headlining act. But when we showed up to the gig, it was a straight hip hop crowd. And Lisa was like, I don't think we should be headlining this show. You know, this, this is a rap crowd. So, uh, and I think Lisa had spoke with Naughty's, Naughty's people and they actually switched. So uh, we opened and we got out of there. <laughs> you know, so that, I think whoever put us on that bill, I don't know why, why we were there, but so many different acts, man, especially back when, when Lisa was, I mean, I, I can't even say when she was popping because she's, she's still popping. They're still doing shows and you know, they're all over the place right now. So I, I that, would have that was a group. No, that, I, I would have thought that, uh, you know, at least some portion of that show would have been pre-recorded tracks, but was it all live? Um, pretty much we played everything live. You know, we, we had, a we played everything live, man. All of that stuff was live. We didn't use any drum machine. I never used a drum machine with that. But I, at one point, I was using an electronic Simmons kit because I remember uh, uh, Full Force, they wanted us to, to cop that electric sound as, you know, as close to the record as possible. But we never used a drum machine. You know? And then at, after a while, those, those things, they were just tearing my, my arms up. You know, because they they weren't as nice and advanced as they are now with the mesh pads. Back then, they were just straight, like hard uh, rubber or plastic, whatever that stuff was, and it used to hurt. I used to hate playing those things. So uh, I finally got them to get me a real drum set, and it was it was a crazy drum set, man. It was like drums all around me. We had a jungle gym, and it was just like you know, really, really, really fun, man. It was a great time for me. Wow, that's a great experience for sure. Um, you know, you mentioned Prince early on. Of course, he's one of my favorites too. And I'm just curious since, you know, during that era, um, did you cross paths with Prince at all or get to meet him? Never got a chance to meet Prince. You know, I, I've been in, you know, in, in areas where he was, you know, backstage and, and uh, you know, seen him walk by and stuff like that. And I remember being in California uh some awards and i saw him and i thought about going over to him and i said you know what i'm not gonna do it because because back then is when he was kind of like you know with the with the sunglasses and he ain't looking at you he ain't gonna give you the time of day at least that's you know what 
the image that he portrayed back then. So, and I was cool with it. I was like, you know what? I love him anyway, you know? So uh, that's, that's one big regret that, uh, I, I shouldn't say regret, just let down and I wasn't able to meet Prince, you know, to jam with Prince, you know? I would love to, I jam with Andre Simone, you know? Uh, Cause my dad had produced uh, a song on one of his records back in the day. And Andre actually stayed with us for about a week when I was living at home. So, uh, you know, I'd be in the studio, in my dad's studio, me, him, and Andre, and I'd just hanging out watching, you know, learning. And, uh, you know, Andre would show me some things on the bass, and he, you know, I'd try to play it and, you know, that kind of thing. That's the closest I came to, to meeting, you know, Prince was through Andre. But uh, Andre's a killer on his in his own right, man. He's a killing bass player, killing uh, producer, writer. So that was huge fun for me. That's great. He did those few solo records before he got big with Jody Watley. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that Jody Watley stuff was huge. Yeah. So you know, when I look through your credits, uh, Hugh, <clears throat> um, a lot of times they get mixed up on the internet with your dad's. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, try to get some clarity to, you know, what you've done versus, you know, your dad. So, um, what I'm looking at here, it shows uh, Ray Goodman and Brown. Was that a project that you were part of? On that. Yeah. But I just wanted to say one thing to that. How come they can't mix up the checks? <laughs> come on. <laughs> they always get that right. <laughs> Yeah, I thought you were going to say maybe they all go to your dad. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives you your allowance like when you were a kid, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, Ray Goodman and Brown, that was a session that I did years ago. Uh, I, I don't even know what the name of the song was, man, but it was years ago. But yeah. And I see uh, Force MDs. Uh, my dad wrote and produced for them, but I also played on one of the records. Uh, I couldn't tell you the name of the record. It was so long ago. All right. Well, good so far, though. Um, Sweet yeah. Obsession. What was the name again? Sweet Obsession. Sweet Obsession. It's like a dance, female dance uh, act um, on Epic. 1988. Uh, I'm going to say that that's probably my dad because I don't remember that. Um, so Erica Badu, how did you come in contact with her? Uh, how did that evolve? Uh, with Erica, that, that happened um, through a friend of mine, uh, Norman Hurt, uh, the keyboard player. Uh that was uh, the MD on the gig for Erica, and we call him Keys. Uh, he had called me when they were putting the band together. This was before the record had even come out. And he was, I was living in Rhode Island at the time. And he was like, hey, you, man, you know, got this gig, man. It's pretty interesting. I think you'll enjoy it. And I wasn't interested. I didn't want to go on the road. I didn't want to do any gigs and come up to, to New York. And I was just kind of like in my own little zone. So I, I passed on. <clears throat> you know, a little later, he called me again. He was like, you, man, this it's really looking like it's going to be something. And I was like, "Keys, I, you know, I'm, I'm just not into it. And he called me a third time. And he said, you, I'm telling you, you know, this is going to be something. So. I checked it out, you know, came to New York, went to the rehearsal and, you know, uh, got into it. And we started doing, you know, hits in the, in the city and people just loved her, man. It was like when, when we played, it was just the three of us, uh, Keys, Poojie Bell and myself in the, in the in turn, three of us terms of the rhythm section. And we had the background singers. You could hear like a pin drop at those shows, man. You know, people were just at attention. They were just fixated on Erica, you know. And I was like, you know what? I think I might need to stay around for this. 
And I'm so glad that I did because uh, to this day, you know, if I'm known for anything, it's always uh, Erica Badu. That's what, you know, bass players contact me about. And, uh, you know, whenever I meet different musicians, that's, that's what usually comes up, you know, and I'm totally cool with it because it's something that was just a highlight of my career. It really was. You know, to, just to, to have that experience and to be there from the beginning, you know, and, and see her at her peak, you know, at that time. And Erica's still like, you know, on top. She, you know, she's doing all kind of stuff now. So I love Erica, man. I, I, I just like, thank you for that experience. Definitely. What, what was your early impression of her upon meeting? My early impression of her, I was intrigued. I was confused um, because she she wasn't your typical artist. You know, she was very like just experimental, very, uh, she would take chances and she just didn't give a damn. So it was kind of like, like, wow, <laughs> okay. But it worked for her. You know, and, you know, all of us have had like that friend. And I'm not saying that she's like this. The point that I'm trying to make is certain people can get away with certain things. And if you try it, you get in trouble for it. That's how, you know, she, she, uh, the, uh, the, the feeling that I got from her was that she could go on stage. She could say whatever the hell she wanted and she's going to pull it off. You know, she's going to find a way to make it work. And she did. She did all the time. And once I saw that, I was just like, hey, lead, lead us, do what you do. And she did. She did it, man. She just blew the door open. Yeah. I mean, I that's do. the mark of, a, of an artist who follows her muse and believes in their art, you know, whether it's Prince or her, um, you know, or um, Dave Chappelle and comedy. And, you know, you got to love yeah. these people for sure. Um, what struck you about her singing and her musical talent uh, aside from her temperament? I would say that uh, she she would always search. She she's like that that musician who isn't worried about hitting the wrong note. Who's going to try to to push the envelope? You know, when you might say, ah, oh, what is where where he where is he or she going? It's, you know, come back. No, she's gonna keep going and make it into something. And then you're gonna say, Oh, wow. And and she would do stuff like that, you know. She she didn't care if she hit a wrong note, she's gonna go for the riff and always experimenting, always pushing the envelope, whether it was with her image, you know, her look. Um, lyrics, you know, the, the topics. She just was not typical, man. She was just like, because there would be times when, when I'm playing on stage and I'm fixated and I'm looking at her like in the days, you know, I'm laughing at the jokes, you know, thank God, you know, I, I just knew the material it was embedded in all of us. We, you know, we were well rehearsed, but if you could get caught off guard by her because she would, She's always changing stuff. Like even during the show, she might say, I mean, even on the live record, there's there's a song. Uh, I, I don't remember what song it was. It was so long ago. But she says, Hey, hey, I don't want to do that right now. Let's 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 do something else. Play that, play that. And then we went into Tyrone. I think it was the other side of the game she had a snap. But and I remember we were like, Oh, what do, what are we gonna do? We didn't know what was gonna happen. So she would do stuff like that a lot, crack jokes. You know, she might, uh, I remember one time she was introducing the band and she introduced me as Bubba. And the crowd is cracking up, the band members, are I didn't like it, to be honest with you. I was kind of like, really, Bubba? But she was just a comedian, man. She, she, she'd have you cracking up at sound check, you know, even like that whole Tyrone thing, you know, that, that was a joke. That was just kind of like a fluke. And I think that was one of her biggest records. So 
And you just played amazing. bass with her? You did drums, some drums, or all, only bass? Only bass, yeah. How much did she direct you and what you did? Um, she definitely had uh, input, you know, you know, here and there in terms of like with certain grooves, like she might sing a bass line here and there. But for the most part, the musical direction came from from keys and just us as a unit. You know, they they had a lot of trust in myself and Pooji and you know, keys would tell us, you know, this is the groove, and and we would just groove. We would take it. You know, sometimes I'm throwing little things in there. Pooji's doing his thing. Keys is doing his thing, and then sometimes Keys might say, Nah, let's 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 bring it back. You know, to the record, or Erica might say, Nah, I don't like that. You know, do this, and she'll start singing a bass groove or something like that. So it was it was kind of like between Keys and Erica or a group effort. You know. We, we would just make it happen, man. D'Angelo is another cat, you know, I kind of think of in that category, too. Scary. I always wanted to work with him, too. I haven't as of yet, but hopefully one day he'll give a brother a call, and uh, I would love to play that stuff, man. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Go right with him, man. That would be what, cool. what, was Erica ever, though, so temperamental that maybe she stormed off stage or anything like that, or it was never, like, on that level? Nah. Mm -mm. I've never seen that happen. Not, not, not during my time, you know. Erica was just, like, she was in, in, in her moment, you know. She loved it. She loved it, you know. And how long I've was never it? seen her. Yeah. How long was that tour? Uh... I would have to say we toured for at least a year and a half, two years, something like that, you know, off and on. You know, we, we worked a lot. You know, we were all over the place and did a lot of TV. Uh, I mean, it was, it was just like, aside from the whole Lisa Lisa experience, the Erica experience was probably, um, it wasn't as fun because you know, times are different now in terms of like, you know, I wasn't out there playing basketball and, and you know, uh, using, uh, playing with remote control cars and stuff like that. It was more business, but it was enjoyable musically. You know, we just, we always had a good time on stage, you know, even, you know, playing the same songs every night, it still felt different because they would let us improv. They would let us play around and, and, and sometimes extend the song a little longer than normal. You know, Erica might start, she might start singing something differently that, that she did the, the previous day, previous gig. So you, you, you always had to be ready with her because you never knew what was going to happen. So time-wise, that's, you know, around the late 90s. Um, what were you doing or pursuing in terms of your own musical muse? Were you writing songs? Were you recording on your own? What was happening there? I was always writing songs, trying to pitch songs, uh, trying to place, get my songs placed. Uh, I ended up having a, uh, a, publishing, a publishing deal with EMI. So I was trying to uh, pitch songs to different artists, you know, R&B artists, some, some hip hop artists, tracks and, and things like that. And uh, I didn't have any, any big success. You know, I got a couple of placements here and there, but um. That's, that was really my thing that I wanted to break into. Jingles, you know, I did a few jingles, things like that. But um, the, the, uh, the writing and production was very clicky, you know, and, and it still is somewhat. But now because pretty much you can do everything yourself now. If, if, if a record company's not feeling you, you become the record company. The A and R person is not digging your material. You A and R the project. But back then, you know, if you weren't in the click, if you didn't know certain people, um, you know, if you weren't giving up your publishing, there was there was just a lot of a lot of uh, obstacles back then to try to get get songs placed. And 
I just didn't have the success that that I wanted back then. But I stuck with it, and I'm you know I'm still doing it, and you know now I'm I'm doing my own thing, which I'm really having fun, you know, and just trying to experiment and see, you know, what I can come up with. Well, on your credits, I also show Glenn Jones. Was that correct? I did play on a Glenn Jones record. Uh, I think that was, it may have been produced by, you know what? I don't remember the producer, man. This, you're going way back. That's amazing, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just 20 years ago, uh, 2002. Yeah. Um, and Will Downing stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So how long have you been gestating, you know, and working on your own stuff? I mean, you must have built up a lot of songs by now. I got a lot of material. We got a lot of ideas, a lot of fragments. You know, I still have stuff on DAT tape, on mini disc, on cassette tape. You know, I have all of that stuff. But um, I never really thought about being the actual artist. Like, I, I didn't come up like, you know, I want to be an artist and I want to tour. I want to do, they, you know, my own band and things like that. I always wanted to to just produce. I wanted to be able to sit back and produce for whomever, for everybody. I love being in the studio. Um, it wasn't until I got, got a little older, you know, and that I said, you know what? I want to start doing my, my own thing. I want to, you know, I've played in enough bands and a lot of times, you know, I'm in bands and I'm hearing arrangements and I'm, I want to do things a little different, you know? And I'm, I said, you know what? I'm going to have to do it. So in, in 2020, I put my first song out uh, called Radio, and that was a lot of fun. Didn't make a whole lot of noise, but that's okay. You know, it was it was satisfying for me to be able to uh, to set a goal and to to see it happen, and I'm proud of it. You know, I'm really really proud of it, and I, I just kept going, and uh, from there I put out song called uh, Da Di Da that uh, I co-wrote with uh, Mr. Barry Eastman, who is a, a legend, you know, as a musician and a producer, great person, great friend. And uh, that did fairly okay in the smooth jazz. You know, I got on the smooth jazz chart, smooth jazz network, and they were playing it on a lot of different smooth jazz stations. And, uh, and then that, you know, my current single, Incubated Funk, I don't, I don't know, I, maybe I, I'm jumping a gun. I should let you bring that up, huh? Bad <laughs> Hubert. <laughs> hey, it's going to come up either way. And, uh, yeah, it's a jam. I appreciate you sending it over. And, uh, you know, it's right in my alley for sure. Uh, it's deep in the groove, deep in the pocket. And you got Daryl Dixon from Chops Horns. I don't know if uh, his partner Dave is on there too. Um, oh, yeah. But, um uh, is Cheryl Pepsi Riley is doing vocals. Yep. Yeah. Yes, so how did you come in contact with those folks? Yeah, man, I got a crew and a half on this, on this record. Um, incubated funk came together. Uh, it was a concept that I, that I had back when I did the song radio. As a matter of fact, when radio at the end of the song, I say something like, you know, uh, listen out for incubated funk ep coming soon something like that i always wanted to do something with that you know because I, I was born premature and I, I had this picture it's the actual picture of me in the incubator and i just i saw it as an album cover and i just saw it as as i, I thought it would be cool i thought it would be interesting so the title i, I already i had musically i knew it, it had to be something real funky because you can't come out with with the word funky in your song ever and it's not funky you know and, and i've seen that done sometimes but for me i'm like it's gonna have to be funky so i wanted to approach it a little different than the regular writing style that you know my my regular writing approach so i came up with the bass lines and I had the drum beat, and I didn't want to put anything else on it. 
you know, because usually I'll put some keyboards or I might play guitar. And I'll try to finish the track off. Nope. I want it to be horn heavy. I wanted it to be, originally it was just going to be bass, a kick and snare, and just horns and nothing else. So uh, Chops, they had played on my song radio. And uh, they killed it. They, they just absolutely took it to the next level. So I knew I wanted them on it. I contacted uh, Daryl Dixon and I said, look, D, I got this track called Incubated Funk. Go nuts on it. I said, I don't have no, no melody on it. I don't have, there's no instruments. It's just me playing bass. But I want you to just, whatever you feel. And he was like, well, what if I put too much? You know, um, isn't it going to step on the, the vocal or the melody? I said, don't worry about it. Just do whatever you want to do. Put as much stuff in it as you want. And boy, did he. You know, he, he wrote one of the baddest horn arrangements for me that I ever heard. Killing it. So much so that part of his uh, melody I ended up using. So we, we ended up writing this song together. It's, it's a co-write, me and Daryl Dixon. It was only right because the, the horns are so prevalent in the song and uh, the melody in the verse that I'm doubling on bass, he came up with that melody. So uh, when, they, when I got the horns back, I said, you know what? I got to put some more stuff on this because uh, this is, it has the potential to really be something. So, uh, you know, I did the vocals, you know, my little parts. And then me and Cheryl Pepsi Riley, we go way, way back, back to the Lisa Lisa days. And I, I had been telling her for years that I wanted to work with her. And she'd be like, okay, call me, call me, blah, blah, blah. You know, probably didn't believe me, but I always knew at some point that we would work together. So I got her in on it. She came in and... uh you know, we did some arranging on the vocals and then she would do some things that, you know, I'm not a singer. I'm not a real singer at all. <clears throat> she took it to another level. And then, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I had Mark, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. I had uh, Mark Bowers come in on guitar. He came in and blazed it. He did a bunch of tracks, you know, and I kind of just picked the ones that that I liked and that he liked. And uh, Shedrick Mitchell on Oregon, he came, he killed it. Dean James killed it. And uh, Incubated Fall, that's, that's how it happened, man. It was just kind of a, an experiment. You know, it was just going to be bass drums and horns, but it turned out to be what it is now. So I'm very happy and proud of it. Well, congratulations, thank, you know. Thank you, man. Yeah, and I, I thank all of those guys, because uh, guys and girls, because... um. They took it to another level with me. So, absolutely, it's um, got that. You know, at its core foundation is that JB funk kind of, you know, vibe. But you know, more contemporized with, you know, some of the through P funk through eighties, you know, to now. Oh yeah, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, real quick, uh, the goal that I had as a bass player. <clears throat> You know, coming up as a bass player, you know, we all, let me not speak for all bass players, but I remember being young and the thing was to be able to thump in the key of E, right? That's that's what the bass player, if they said it was an E, you went nuts. But for me, thumping in the key of E would get boring after a while. I mean, you can only jam, but for so long. So aside from it being incubated funk, it's also a challenge for me as a bass player and my tribute to the key of E minor, which I love to make the song go like this to where there's no lulls. It doesn't fall off and you get, Oh God, it's just, why don't they change keys? I purposely kept it in one key just to challenge the groove to see if we could be at one groove here, a groove here again, keep changing, just keep changing the bass line each time. And that was my approach as a bass player. So that, that was pretty different. That's why there's no, there's no bridge. There's no, 
you know, C section or anything. It's just straight E minor. So that was yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. And over five minutes of that groove too, you know, and yeah. yeah. Which is always yeah. cool. I hate when the groove gets cut too short, you know? Um, and you name check um, your dad on there. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you name check your dad, your pops. Yeah, my dad and and James Williams. I had to had to give them their props. That was something I always wanted to do, and I figured, being that I'm not doing uh, uh you're the one for me over. That was kind of like my way of saying, you know, what's up, thank you. And the drum beat, that's that's a D train beat. It's a straight, you know, same beat from you're the one for me. You know, so that's why I kept it. I had to, you know, the drummer, Dean James, you know, when we spoke, I was like, hey, man, just no fills. And Dean just looked at me, he goes, you know, I got you, man. And I didn't have to say nothing. He just came in straight down. Two takes. Hmm. Love that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And now the, the name has a whole new meaning on top of it, too, because, you know, everything just kind of incubated and percolated and and gelled and, you know, into what it ultimately became. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I'm proud of it, man. If it never becomes a, a hit or anything, that was not the motivation. That was not like the agenda. It was just, you know, I've been doing this smooth jazz thing, trying to trying to break into that genre. and I I just felt like, you know what, I just, I want to get loose. I just want to do something where I'm not worried about the radio playing it. I'm not worried about it being commercial. You know, if, if none of the radio stations play it, I don't care. This is for, it's for the musicians. This is for the funksters. This is for the people who want to groove, you know, who, who love horns, who love, you know, just, you know, that, that soul. And I, I hope that, that we accomplish that, you know. But I'm happy with it. That's for sure. So what can we expect in terms of, you know, will there be an EP or an LP or what are you working toward here? I'm planning on releasing an uh, EP uh, in March or April. We'll see. But I definitely got more stuff coming. I got more stuff coming. And I'm, I'm, I've am I'm been getting such a good response uh, about an incubated funk that, uh, like I said, I was just taking a little break from doing the smooth jazz thing because I wanted to put something out there that that was just, you know, like personal fun for me. But might have to do another one, man. <laughs> Take it up a notch. I hope so. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah, like, definitely. you know, George Duke, when he came with Reach for it, he had to do Dookie Stick, you know, he had to go back. Yeah, man, you, you can't stop, you know. Because uh, there's there's some other musicians and, you know, other players that I, I want to include. You know, I'm, I got so many friends, like I, I mentioned earlier, and a lot of times in, when I've, I've done interviews and I'm asked, who's your favorite this or who's your favorite that, that, it's usually my friends. But, you know, you can't get to all of them, you know, on, on every project. But I, I have a list. I actually have a list of all the people that I want to call. And I know some people get mad at me or they, they think that, uh, you know, I ain't thinking about them. But. They're on a list, and when I can get to them, I will, sure. But there's going to be some more funk coming, because that, that's what I feel naturally. That's, that's where I'm at. That's what I'm most happy. What do you like doing when you're not doing music? Uh, I like watching sports, and I don't play as much as I used to, because I'm, I'm getting old. <laughs> and uh, matter of fact, I was shooting some baskets a couple weeks ago. And uh, cause I remember when I was a kid, I used to play basketball all day, all night. And I remember when the old guys would come and say, hey, hey, shorty, you know, let me get a shot. Woo -woo. And we'd laugh at them. They missed the whole gram and everything. But that was me a couple of weeks ago, you know. And I, I was uh, walking by a park and I was with my wife and I was like, you know what? She's always saying, I, I don't believe you were ever you know, athletic. And I used to say, I used to be able to dunk. I used to, you know, I used to really you know, be able to play. She's like, get out of here. So I had the guy throw me the ball and I airballed every shot. I must have shot around seven straight shots and each one was an air ball. She's just looking at me like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I 
So that that I felt like a big failure, man. It wasn't <laughs> a good experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When but, you haven't done it in a while. I mean, you can. It's weird how you just. Yeah. You know, but sometimes if you put some time in, it comes back. The shot comes back. You know, but those first several shots, man. Oof. Yeah, that was tough, and and I actually I was winded just from jump shots. I was winded, like I played a, a full court game. So I don't I don't know if I even care to even get in shape for that again. I'm, I'm done. Give me my base. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, before I let you go, um, I wanted to ask you. I like to ask uh, most of my guests, you know, uh, for their five favorite albums of all time. So if you could only have five albums that you could listen to none that you're a part of um and you know i know it's not definitive but an example of what the five might be okay uh and this is in no particular order uh yeah. all the name is bootsy inner visions is one like i'm a big stylistics fan and so the best of the stylistics um that that particular album the songs on that album love it chucky booker his first album um that album was oh my god it was amazing man he's he's another one ohio players fire album Can you see it that one was killing yeah that one's signed by sugar was it yeah yeah i i remember pr practicing with that album you know that's five. Well, I always have a hard time with uh, the Ohio players, whether it would be fire or honey, but they're, they're both so incredible. Uh, it's, Stevie, I always go to Intervisions. So many people do songs in the key of life. Intervisions is it for me. Yeah, and, yeah. And Bootsy, too, that second album, you know, because the slow tracks even are as hot as the up-tempo. I mean, that second album just kills. Yeah, them slow tracks, man. Space bass on them, too. <laughs> a telephone bill and munchies yeah munchies yeah oh yeah so you're a funkster man oh. <laughs> died in the wool man yeah, yeah. man huh. yeah. and then most uh stylistics um didn't uh tom bell do some of their songs we just lost him yeah yeah we just yeah lost i him. know yeah. i was really really sad to hear that but some of those songs I mean, you know, bet you my golly, wow, and uh, uh, people make the world go around, and that that stuff was so melodic, and the production, the strings, and um, like you'll hear like some of the material that I have coming down the pipeline, you'll hear that influence because I'm sure some people say you're influenced by stylistics. I haven't heard that yet. You will. <laughs> Because I love that stuff. As much as I love funk, I love a beautiful ballad, a beautiful melody. You know, string. I love strings. I love horns. And uh, I just think that's from, you know, from back in the day when I used to see those sessions with my dad and, you know, those songs back in that era. You had strings. You had horns. You had guitars. You had, you know, full band. So, it, unfortunately, it just costs a lot of money to cut tracks like that. But, I got some stuff like that coming. Very cool. Um, and then Chucky Booker, he's he was on the show recently. I haven't aired the show yet, but uh, had a lot of fun with him. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, when Chucky came out, man, no word of a lie. I must have, because I was giving his cassette away to people. Because I would ask somebody, you know, these are all musician friends. Have you heard of Chucky Booker? Nah. Here, take this. And I go buy another one. And, uh, I haven't met him yet, you know, uh, and we're, we're kind of like friends on social media, you know, that 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 kind of thing. But I can't wait to uh, meet him and hopefully get to jam with him, man, because he's been a big influence, you know, and uh, a lot of admiration for his his production and his uh, his playing, you know, that whole camp. Crazy. Yeah, he's another guy too who much prefers the production and that side of things to being the actual upfront guy. Um, but then when he did the upfront thing, he was so successful at it. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I'm, I'm sure you, you probably spoke to him about it. So I'm going to wait for the interview. I can't wait to see it. But I know he was supposed to come out with a new record. I thought it was going to be out last September. And I've been waiting for it. And I'm like, come on, Chuck. Like, yeah, come on. Hit it, brother. All. <laughs> yeah, it's been like 25 years. Yeah, he, he got to come. He got to come with something. <laughs> but I like I the, the second one he did, too. The second one was was crazy. I yeah. loved it. The, the first one just it hit me, you know, more, I guess, but just because it was the first one. That's but. Frontline, the song he did, Frontline. I know you know that one. Yeah. Just, oh my God. So funky. So what are you most uh, proud of accomplishing thus far in your music life? What am I most proud of? I'll tell you one proud moment that I had. This was just as a touring musician. Back in the day, I was playing with Erica Badu and Will Downing. And we did a, a Essence Festival something back to back. So one night, I played drums with Will Downing. The next night, I played bass with uh, Erica. And that I just remember feeling like, wow, that, that's a, a pretty nice accomplishment for me personally. So I'm proud of that. I'm really, really proud of that. To have been able to do that on that level, on, on two different instruments. Were there some people at both shows that took note? Yeah, I, I remember a friend of mine, Sid, he, he saw both shows and He's the one that pointed it out to me because to me, I was just in the moment, you know, it was two gigs, one gig I'm playing bass, one gig I'm playing drums. But when he pointed it out, I actually thought about it. I'm like, you know what? It is something to be proud of. You know, it's, it's not, you know, in a braggadocious way. It's just for me, Hubert Eves the fourth. It's a proud moment for me. You know? So. Is there a Hubert Eves the fifth? My son, yes. There is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. what's the musical talent situation there? You know what? I tried. You know, <laughs> I, I tried to get him to play drums, but he was just like, mm. he's he loves music, but he doesn't play anything. You know, he probably could if he wanted to, but he's not interested. Mm. He, I learned. He's a great I, son, though. <laughs> yeah. I, I have just one kid, a son also, and I, I learned eventually. You know, you can't push them. They got to take to it. And at some point, you just got to, okay. Yeah. 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 It's, it's all good, though. Proud of them. Well, is there anything we didn't <laughs> touch on that you want to uh, share with the people before we wrap this up? Uh, I would definitely like to ask that people follow me on, uh, you know, you can get all my links up at my website, which is hubertevesiv.com. You know, you can get to my Facebook, to my uh, uh, Instagram, you know, that kind of thing. Bandcamp, if, you, if you're looking to purchase Incubated Funk, right now it is only available on Bandcamp. Uh, it will be available on all streaming sites January 20th, which is next week, I believe, on Friday. Um all my other stuff is on all streaming sites, radio and dot di, and I got more stuff coming. Be on the lookout. Definitely be on the lookout, and you know I want to see it in my inbox as well. Oh, uh, you're gonna you're gonna have it. <laughs> Matter of fact, I my my next single is gonna be a, a remake. I can't say what it, what it is yet, but I kind of got a feel for you now. I think you're gonna like. You're gonna appreciate. It. You definitely will. So I'll make sure I send it to you. All right. Well, I appreciate you and appreciate you spending the time. And thank you so much for sharing and for all the music you've given us. Uh, Hubert, much appreciated. And thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. And, and thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time and asking great questions. And I know when uh, when you edit it, it's going to be nice and, and smooth and cool. So I, I look forward to checking it out, man. And, and I really appreciate you, brother. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. 
A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the Media Services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one.